<laughs> All right. I bet most of you probably won't remember the very first message that was that was recorded you know back almost a year ago now when we had to do the pandemic you know when we had to go to the uh, online format because of the pandemic but just in case you have an inkling it was Palm Sunday last year or very close to it and it was the story about Jesus being anointed well remember there are actually two stories uh, about Jesus being anointed at supper and the various tellings disagree over whether it was his head or his feet or well or who it was or why I mean and yeah you know, because remember it the three of the Gospels agree when it happened more or less although there's a several days difference in between them and why it was done and the fourth one places it at a completely different time for a completely different reason but the three that come together are not the three you expect because usually you would expect Matthew Mark and Luke to clump to clump together and John to be separate but in this case it's Luke that's the outlier so let me read John's version of it which is the first part of chapter 12 of John if you want to follow um, six days before the Passover Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was whom Jesus had raised from the dead there they made him a supper. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at table with him. Then Mary took a pound of costly ointment of pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples who, who was to betray him, said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? So basically that works out to a year's salary almost. This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. And as he had the money box, he used to take what was put into it. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Let her keep it for the day of my burial. The poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. And Matthew and Mark add the note that Jesus also said that it was a beautiful thing that she had done. She did what she could she had brought it to anoint him beforehand for his burial and that wherever the gospel was told in the entire world this story would be told in memory of her and Luke's version of course is that it happened at a completely different time early at much earlier in Jesus career and that the woman who came in on a private dinner party that Jesus had been invited to was actually in a fairly hysterical frame of mind. She, she was ready for a change of life. She was known around town as a sinner. And all you grown-ups know what, what sort. And Jesus' host, who was named Simon, and that's a detail that is common to more than one of these accounts, because in uh, Matthew and Mark, it's the home of Simon the leper in Bethany. You know, Simon says to himself, 
If this man really were a prophet, he would know what sort of woman this is. And Jesus tells a story about two men who owed money to a third man. The first one owed, owed the man a lot of money, more than he could ever possibly pay. And the second man owed just a little bit. And, he's, and he turns to Simon and says, which one of these men do you think lo you know, loved the person who, to whom they owed the money, who graciously forgave them their debts? You know, who do you think loved this man more? And Simon said, well, the man who owed the most money, of course. And Jesus said, well, Simon, when I came here, your reception of me was, was actually a bit on the skimpy side. You didn't, you didn't give me water to wash my feet. You know, and in those days, they would assign the lowest slave in the household to wash the feet of all the family members and the guests after they had been out traveling and come in for the evening. But, you know, she, you know, she's washed my feet with her tears. You gave me no oil to anoint my head. But she anointed me with perfume. So I say to you that although her sins were many, they're forgiven. And from that, and the fact that Pope Gregory the Great, the one who sent the mission to Canterbury to, to restart Christianity in England, um, couldn't keep his Marys and the New Testament straight, you know, that's where you have the legend that it was Mary Magdalene who is mentioned at the start of the very next chapter in Luke. And so, you know, I went into all of that, and I won't bother to go into all of that again now. How many of you knew that when Jesus uttered that remark, the poor you always have with you, he was actually quoting scripture? Did anybody know that? See, most people don't, and that's the thing. And, you know, the disciples, presumably, at least some of them, would have known that. Certainly, uh, any Jewish person hearing the story who was, who was knowledgeable, it's in Deuteronomy 15. I was going to write in there because it wasn't in my margin, but I was going to write it there. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Deuteronomy 15, 11, to be exact. Which is actually about... the sabbatical year and the freeing of slaves and remission of debts of all things. <clears throat> so so let, me, let me read the first part of the chapter to you. At the end of seven years, you shall practice remission of debts. This shall be the nature of the remission. Every creditor shall forgive the, the due that he claims from his fellow. He shall, not, he shall not exact from his fellow or kinsman, for the remission proclaimed is from the Lord. You may charge the foreigner, but you must remit whatever is due you from your kinsman. There shall be, listen to this bit, there shall be no needy among you, since the Lord your God will bless you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you as a heritage if only you heed the Lord your God and take care to keep all this instruction that I enjoin upon you this day. For the Lord your God will bless you as he has promised you. You will extend loans to many nations, but, require, but pay none yourself. You will dominate many nations, but they will not dominate you. If, however, there is a needy person among you, one of your kinsmen in any of your settlements in the land that the Lord is giving you, 
Do not harden your heart and close your hand against your needy kinsman. Rather, you must open your hand and lend him sufficient for whatever he needs. Beware lest you harbor the base thought. The seventh year, the year of, rem of remission, is approaching so that you are stingy to your needy kinsman and give him nothing. He will cry out to the Lord against you and you will incur guilt. Give to him readily and have no regrets when you do, when you do so. For in return, the Lord your God will bless you in all your efforts and in all your undertakings. For there will never be, there will never cease to be needy ones in your land. Or, if you prefer, the poor you will always have with you. Which is why I command you, open your hand to the poor and needy kinsmen in your land. So instead of the spin that is usually put on that verse, which actually makes Jesus sound not very good, to be quite honest, it's actually an indictment of you for not structuring things so that you don't have any beggars. The same thing is true with that other with that other passage, you know, from 2 Thessalonians 3, he who will not work, let him not eat. Well, when 2 Thessalonians was written, in contrast to the very first generation of Christians, you had begun to get Christians who had money, who were basically living as the idle rich. All, you know, off of their fellows who were less well off. So you can't really use either one of them to justify being stingy when you are confronted with the very real need in our society. Because let's face it, this country is nasty to poor people. This country is nasty to people of color, but it's also nasty to, to poor people, and you put and we put taxes on them for being poor. Now, don't get me wrong. I quite agree with the requirement that you have to have your vehicle inspected every year. It's a smart thing to do. But to turn around and charge somebody who couldn't afford to do it to begin with, especially if they still can't afford it after a month, after you catch up with them. I mean, that's just debtor's prison. What sense does that make? Do you know about debtor's prison, Ollie? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, you know, you know what famous writer? Dickens. Dickens, that's right. Charles Dickens was the son. Do you know what... Uh, do you know what uh, first lady of this country also had a similar experience? She was actually born a Quaker. Oh, Dolly Madison. Dolly Madison. Her father ended up in debtor's prison because he couldn't pay he couldn't pay his bills. And I agree with the idea of there having to be some sort of restitution. But, but having the restitution be in, the, in a form that prevents the person who owes the debt from actually paying the debt does not make any sense. Now, I, am not go, I am not going to preach politics, but there, is, but there is an overlap between politics and morality. And we would be better served sometimes if we worried less about who was pairing up with whom and more about the way we deal with people who can, you know, who can barely afford to get by at the best of times and when they are confronted with unexpected expenses can't manage at all.
There is a there is a story. Do you, Ollie, do you know anything about the Jewish Passover? Uh, okay. Okay. Do you know that the meal, you know that the meal is called a seder, right? Uh, no, I didn't. Okay. Well, seder is the Hebrew word for order, and it refers to the order in which you have to do things. Now, there's a story about a young man who comes to his local rabbi and asks, Rabbi, I, I need to ask a question. And the rabbi says, go ahead. And the young man says, I know that the commandment is that we have wine at the Seder and or in a lot of seders, what they do is they just use grape juice as a substitute because some people aren't old enough for access to wine and some people, you know, are alcoholics and can't, you know, and can't have it. And the rabbi says, well, is there a health reason that you can't have wine at your seder? Are you, know, are you diabetic? Uh, is anybody in your family alcoholic? And the young man says, no. And the rabbi says, I'm sorry then, in that case, the commandment is quite clear, you have to have wine. And the young man is about to turn and go away. And the rabbi stops him and says, hold a second. And he and he digs into his change purse and he brings out several gold coins, far more than it would cost to buy a few bottles of wine for the Seder. And the rabbi's wife has come up by this point and she sees what happens. And after the young man leaves, she says to her husband, you can't, you can't possibly believe that, that wine costs that much money. It just doesn't. I mean, I know that I, I do more of the day-to-day -day running of the household than you do, but even you know that wine just isn't that expensive. And the rabbi says, didn't it ever occur to you what the man was really asking? And she says, no, what? And the rabbi said, if, the man, if a man has to go to his rabbi and ask for permission to substitute wine for, at the Seder with milk, you know, he has to use milk instead of wine, the chances are that he's doing that because he can't afford the meal. And so the rabbi had given him money, not only for the wine, but also for the food. Quakers have long taken the lead in recognizing and meeting the need we find around us. You know, we, are, we are most famous for slavery. Did you know that uh, Quakers pioneered the humane treatment of people who were mentally ill? You've heard of the retreat? Uh, no, I don't think I've heard of the retreat, but I have heard okay. of the retreat. Okay, the retreat was the first institution for the mentally ill that actually treated the mentally, Ill, mentally ill with kindness. And this was in the days if you've ever seen a movie called The Madness of King George. No, I haven't. Okay, well, you know that King George III went insane in his last years mm -hmm. and that he had had an earlier bout with it as well. Uh, it was, and it was a medical imbalance. Well, mm -hmm, probably. And, you know, this, you know, this movie is about the story of his earlier episode where they bring in a fellow to treat him, and the fellow, frankly, is abusive to him. 
you know, whenever the king, whenever the king starts venturing outside the straight-laced confines of polite 18th century behavior, you know, the doctor, you know, basically abuses him. You know, he, you know, he's tied up in a straight jacket and, you know, he's tied to a chair and, you know, they won't let him up and he has to modify his behavior before he can get up or whatever. Effective, yes, but needlessly cruel. And, you know, so, you know, so Quakers, you know, Quakers did that as well. Uh, Elizabeth Fry did prison reform. You should look her up sometime. Interesting lady. In fact, there was a famine and also did famine relief in Russia. This was in the mid 19th century. And years later, when the Russians had a famine again, a letter from Russia turned up at friend's house in London asking for Elizabeth Fry, you know, who by that point had been dead for several decades. Because, because the Russians knew that she would help and that people like her would help. Um, you know, right after World War I, the famine relief, who, Herbert Hoover, who later went on to be president, that's how he made his name in the, in the wider world. That's one of the ways anyway. And the list goes on. But I think I would like to draw your attention to a non-Quaker at the close. This is from Martin Luther King from his Beyond Vietnam speech that he delivered exactly one year to the day before his life was, un you know, was so untimely ended. And he says, a true revolution of values will soon cause us to question the fairness and justice of many of our past and present policies. On the one hand, we are called to play the good Samaritan on life's roadside, but that will only be an initial act. One day we must come to see that the whole Jericho road must be transformed so that men and women will not constantly be beaten and robbed as they make their journey on life's highway. True compassion is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. It comes to see that an edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. In a world where people who are at the bottom can actually get a raise during a pandemic by not working because the unemployment benefits pay more than their jobs do, or, or because their part-time job expects them to be available in, on full-time hours so that they can't combine part-time positions like you could even as recently as the 90s, there is something very wrong. And I don't think that we should put up with it anymore. 